but but like other things I'd, I'd be happy to start jumping in some more debates on on just the nature of god at least yeah okay all right well i'm gonna go ahead and, and do a little boring cool. intro for us all right uh what's cool. up guys i am uh very excited to be speaking with dr ryan mullins today about this book right here god and emotions i want to encourage you guys to send in uh, whatever questions you have i know i just posted that we were doing this on facebook and a lot of you guys are already um arguing with me uh and so i would love for you guys to also you know raise those questions to dr mullins because i think this is an important issue and i'm not necessarily i don't necessarily have my mind made up on it so i'm interested in being persuaded either way and i hope you guys can have that attitude uh with that said i want to tell you guys as always me and my um family are extremely grateful uh we now have 420 subscribers we'll be sending uh dr stanglin's book um the letter and spirit of biblical interpretation to one of our last nine subscribers as part of our book giveaway and so thank you guys for supporting um our channel and supporting you know the reason that we do this and if you haven't subscribed to the channel you're going to want to subscribe to the channel because these conversations happen on the worst days at the worst times and the only way you're going to know about them is if you're following this channel so we're kind of doing the reverse instead of putting stuff in the weekend we're putting stuff on the front end so uh subscribe to the channel and share the content if you find it helpful or you're speaking about these issues with anybody that you know uh simply for the fact that you know you guys want to encourage um, other people's in education so uh, uh with uh, with that said dr mullins um are you okay if i ask you like a couple like little personal questions about your podcast and stuff yeah sure go for it all right so so you run a podcast called the reluctant theologian when you just tell me why why are you the reluctant theologian <laughs> well okay so the day after i defended my phd uh dissertation uh there was a conference on the trinity and um, there's some really good speakers there, uh, but I won't name anybody any who the names because I don't want to give certain things away. One speaker gets up there, though, and he starts saying, like, God is an event. God is a happening. And he just kind of starts, like, doing this kind of, like, almost like beatnik poetry. Uh, <laughs> and I can't for the life of me figure out what the man's saying, nor can any of the people that he's supposed to be, like, in, like, debating and dialogue with. And I'm just sitting there going, I got a PhD in this. Like, I really just wasted my life, didn't I? It was, it was kind of like how I felt that day. Yeah. Um, but I just felt God still pushing me to say like, no, keep going, keep going with theology. Like, sure. There's, a, there's a lot of, a lot of nonsense floating around, but just cut through that. Try to figure out how to speak clearly to people and keep going. So I reluctantly decided, okay, I'll, I'll keep going. I'll keep yeah. doing theology. Yeah. So, and yeah. I, I, I sympathize with that a lot, man, because I guess like my whole theological journey, I mean, for the most part, I've been in the church. And uh, when I speak to people about like what the Bible says, and then I have to speak to them about what theologians say, it gets kind of frustrating. Like I told mm -hmm. some of my students the other day, I was like, yeah, I really can't stand theologians. I love reading them, but I can't stand some of the stuff they say. And so I think for a lot of people, I mean, that's kind of the initial impression. Um, sometimes it's an immature impression, but that's an initial impression that, that people mm -hmm. get. Uh, and so, so another thing is I want to ask you about your master's study. So uh, if I understand correctly, you you did your master's at TIAU and you used to like drive around Keith Yandel. Keith Yandel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so it was at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And so um, before Keith retired and, and then more recently passed away, um, he would be doing these weekend classes mm -hmm. at, at, at TEDS on like just philosophy of religion, like really high level philosophy of religion. So they would pay students to go drive up to Wisconsin to, to bring him down for the weekend. Uh, and so you get a couple like a couple hours with him in the car and he's just like great at conversation and then also um just has like this love of like uh chicago style hot dogs that i you know also have a love of uh, and then just have like really good philosophy chats and then you'd get to have like a whole weekend of just like this really high level philosophy of religion stuff with him so yeah it was, it was great stuff it was really good times gotcha gotcha and so what really turned you I, I know that's probably one of the points but what really turned you to uh philosophy of religion and and things like that it was sometime like it was actually like towards the end of my undergrad and then eventually starting the, the master's was I was trying to decide, do I want to do church history or do I want to do um, like just like philosophy? And because a lot of the stuff I, I do is still like a lot of historical theology, but I was just trying to figure out what I really want to focus on. And the a lot of the questions that the philosophers were asking were the same questions I was asking. There's also the same questions a lot of people historically have been asking, but I just found a lot of the philosophers of religion were just doing it in a much more rigorous way yeah. than a lot of theologians, contemporary theologians were doing. And so I was like, I have to pick one to, to the master. And so, okay, here we go. Let's just do philosophy of religion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to uh, say a couple good things about your podcast. I would recommend to everyone who watches this, there's probably way more people who listen to your podcast than watch this. But uh, if I have followers who are not following Brian's podcast or, or Dr. Mullen's podcast, um, I want to uh, tell you guys, look, it's scholarly. Um, you have guests coming from a variety of backgrounds. And uh, Dr. Mullins is great at breaking down what it is 
uh, that they're trying to do and where these arguments are coming from, what motivates these arguments and, you know, what's the you know, what, what's the big takeaway? So, I mean, a lot of what we try to do here, guys, I just want you to know, like, I'm, I'm basically just trying to copy what I think is really good in <laughs> Dr. Mullen's podcast and then leave out the conversations that I'm not as interested in. So I, I would recommend everyone to go follow that. So uh, let's talk a little bit about this book, um, God and Emotions. What led up to this? So a couple different things, uh, some were personal and some were just academic interests. Personal interests were just going through like personal trauma and trying to understand what is it to have emotions and how do I get reconnected to God, um, which was part of the interest there, like for personally. And then academically, it was, it, it was, it's, it's part of an ongoing project of going, what are all the different models of God that, that are available to a Christian to consider? And then once I can identify all those different models of God, then how do I know which one I can start testing them to say, this is the right one, or this is the wrong one for a Christian to affirm. And so this is one piece of that ongoing project of trying to figure out what exactly is the right doctrine of God uh, that fits best with Christianity. Gotcha, gotcha. So you have this personal interest, which it is a question that a lot of people can just begin to think about, you know, kind of do some armchair philosophy about and, you know, just try to relate their experiences to God's. And then you also have this academic pursuit that you're doing. So what is that project going to look like in the end of the day? So at the end of the day, um, this will be several years out because I'm working on a new book right now, a, a second book on God and time. Um, so at the end of the day, it'll be going, here are these five different models of God. So you got your classical theism, your neoclassical theism, open theism, panentheism, and then pantheism. Mm -hmm. And going, let's articulate really clearly what it, how to demarcate each of these and then look at arguments for and against them and then just kind of leave it up to people to figure out where they want to fall, um, in which category they want to fall. So we'll be looking at philosophical arguments, theological arguments, uh, biblical arguments to see which ones are coherent, uh, which ones fit best with uh, scripture, which ones fit best with our experience, which ones fit best with uh, the way the world seems to be. Yeah. So that's that's going to be that what it looks like at the end of the day is just trying to lay out the options for everybody really clearly. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Mullins in a little bit to, um, to speak more about two of those models, but I want you guys in the chat to tell me um, which of these models you identify with? Uh, do you think of yourself as being more of a, a classicalist who may be more Thomistic in their understanding of God? Or do you see yourself being more as a, a neoclassical uh, theist? And we're going to talk about those. But if you already kind of know where you're at, I would love to find out uh, who's listening from what perspective. Um, I don't know about <laughs> like two of the two of the uh, I know you got some criteria. I, I, I think two of them I'm still up in the air about. But uh, yeah, so. So you got this academic pursuit and then you got this personal interest. So let's talk a little bit about what an emotion is and uh, how it is that our emotions are connected to important things like finding the truth and, you know, our, uh, our moral uh, judgments. Yeah. Right. So an emotion is a felt evaluation of a situation. And so what that means is going to involve what's called a cognitive component and an affective component. And so the cognitive component is just the way you're mentally representing uh, like the things in your situation. Mm -hmm. So say I'm like stumbling around at night, um, trying to go to the bathroom. And then I see like a dark shadowy figure in the hallway. Um, you know, I, like, I might get scared mm -hmm. uh, because I'm judging whatever this dark uh, shadowy figure is. Mm -hmm. I'm evaluating it. I'm mentally representing it as being something that is an object that's scary. Mm -hmm. So my, the, the cognitive aspect of the emotion is the mental representation of the world. Mm -hmm. the, the affective component of an emotion, though, that's what it feels like to have that emotion. So there's something that, that is like to be scared or to mm -hmm. judge that something in your hallway at night is scary. Mm -hmm. Now, how this connects with truth and morality and these sorts of things, um, there's a couple different ways. So one of which is um, your emotions are subject to being correct, uh, corrected. Like I could tell you, you have the wrong emotion. Um, you might not like it, but I don't care because uh, I can tell you whatever I want. Um, so say I'm like going down the hallway and I see a dark shadowy figure and I get scared. Um, well, you might go, well, that's just some light bouncing around. It's not like somebody's actually broken into your house. Yeah. If somebody's broken in my house, then I've made the right judgment. I, I have the right to be scared. You know, yeah. like you know, my emotion's right. But it's saying like, I, like I'm completely wrong about that. Like I just, I just evaluated the thing, the situation entirely wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, then I'm like, seems like my reasons for being scared now, they're gone. So my emotion just failed to mm -hmm. accurately represent the way the world is. Mm -hmm. That's one way your emotions can be true or false. Mm -hmm. Um, another way your emotions could be could uh, fail to track reality is the intensity of your emotion. So say that like you're you're at work, mm. uh, you get your paycheck, and it looks like they calculated your 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 paycheck a, a bit wrong, like not terribly off. Like they owe you yeah, they owe you some money, but not like a ton of money. You know, okay. like just screwed up a little bit. You've got you've got the right to be mad. You know, mm -hmm. like uh, but like how mad can you be though? Um, yeah. 
<laughs> Should you go around like punching your boss in the face? You know, like just like flipping tables. I am in that situation. You'd be like, okay, well, like you got the right to be mad, but like, like, they, like you know, chill out. Like, yeah. you've 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 got this way out of proportion. It's yeah, that could yeah. be another way where your your emotion could fail to track um, reality there. So that's like some of the ways it, it connects with truth. Uh, with morality, though, so since I said a, emotion is a felt evaluation of situation and it's tracking values, mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of different ways that it's going to track moral values. Okay. So your emotions are grounded in your cares and your concerns. So okay. what you care about or you're concerned with is what you take to be an object that you think is like worth paying attention to. Because yeah. if you don't care about it, you're not going to pay attention to it. Um, and also something that you think is worthy of you to act on behalf of. So imagine you've got a, a really close friend uh, and you know she cares a lot about her grandmother and then she okay. gets a phone call uh, and it's like the nursing home saying her grandmother's died mm -hmm. and then you see her crying. Yeah. You're like, well, right. She's, she cares about her grandmother. Like she thinks thinking about her grandmother is worth her attention. Yeah. And then the action, the action of crying, that's, she thinks it's worth crying about. Yeah. Um, and what that does is it shows that two things. One, it, sh it reveals her own subjective values. It shows what her what her what she personally cares about, mm -hmm. and it also reveals um, that she's tracking the objective values in the world because it does seem like it's it's it is objectively the case that that's a sad situation, mm -hmm. like that is like a disvalue, like it's bad mm -hmm. when 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 your grandmother passes away. Yeah. Here's another way, though, uh, one final way, I guess I, I can point out in, for how your emotions can connect with truth and and morality. Okay. So Aquinas gives this example of um, what a, like a, what a virtuous person would experience if they see something really tragic. Okay. So if a really virtuous person is encountered with something that's really awful, like really morally awful and tragic, a virtuous person they better be upset. They're going to be upset because that's the that's the that's the, like the virtuous action uh, to mm -hmm. the way to respond. And so Aquinas is like, well, imagine though that like someone sees a really horrible situation and they don't respond by being upset. Uh, what's going on there? And Aquinas is like, well, one option is maybe they just don't know enough. Um, you know, maybe they just lack some moral knowledge. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so they just didn't. They just you know, they saw this horrible thing happen, but they didn't know it was horrible. And yeah. so Aquinas is like, okay, well, you just need a lesson in what's right and wrong. You know? uh -huh. um, or another option is your moral character is really vicious. Uh -huh. So you do know that it's wrong, but you okay. just don't care. Okay. And so Aquinas is like, well, then you've got a, a disgusting moral character, and so something's so something's wrong with you. So you need to like a, a, some moral education in terms of like just adjusting your character, traits, yeah, because they're they're off. You're like a bad kid. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, or like you know that weird friend you have when like you're watching like TV and like something really horrible happens, they start laughing maniacally, and you're like, I don't know if yes. I'm around this kid anymore, you know? Dude, I was at yeah. an awkward conversation last night at a bonfire, where someone laughed about somebody dying. I was like, oh, man, this is like, getting yeah, weird. Not the right, <laughs> right. And so this is one of these cases where you're like, okay, your 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 emotions uh, reveal something subjective about you. They can reveal your subjective values. Yeah. Uh, and then it shows that there's a mismatch between your subjective values and the objective values in the world. Okay. And so these are some of the ways that your emotions interact with uh, morality and truth. Okay, now this is important and we're just skimming over it. <laughs> so I'm going to try to, my best as possible to, uh, my, I'm going to do my best attempt to kind of recap. So there's sure. these two aspects to emotions, right? There's this cognitive aspect, which is the mental representation. And then there's this evaluation that we form of this representation. Like, should I be afraid because of A or, you know, should I rejoice because of B or whatever? So those are the two aspects. And so the first thing that we should know about our emotions is that they can be true or false, right? And we might not like that, but the fact that we don't like that is like kind of evidence that, you know, you have emotions that you think are tracking, you know, what is right and what is wrong. Um, and then also you should have this, uh, there's this spectrum of, of uh, how rational it is to, uh, I guess, give in to your emotions. Is that the right way to put it? Like you don't want to have uh, you don't want to go around punching your boss because you didn't get paid what you want, but maybe there's a little bit of anger you should experience. Something like that. So, uh, so Robert Roberts, he's a philosopher of Baylor, and he talks about um, shallow emotions versus deep emotions. Okay. And so, typically, when we say someone's like, like you say someone like, oh, they're just too emotional. Um, okay. Like what what Roberts means, and he says what we really mean there is is their emotions are really shallow because their concerns, oh. their cares, um, are kind of shallow. Uh, and that's why their emotions just seem to be like fleeting all over the place yeah. or just seem to be like overreacting. Um, yeah. Whereas like the more deep emotions, like they're grounded in really deep cares and concerns. And so 
they're going to be like more properly tracking the right level of intensity. You're not going to just fly off the handle. Um, your emotions yeah. aren't going to be constantly shifting and changing all the time from moment to moment. Um, so yeah, there's something like something kind of in the neighborhood of that, I guess. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's going to kind of put some meat on a question that I'll have about passability because mm -hmm. it, you know, when you couple the fact that, you know, the way, at least the way we experience motions come on that spectrum, which is intuitively true, you know, that that happens. I, it, it, I guess the question raises for me how an omniscient God, um, emotions would fluctuate given circumstances because he's omniscient. So uh, at the very least, he's going to know all true propositions and no false ones. And so it seems like he's going to have like a perfectly stable <laughs> uh, spot right. on that spectrum. But we'll, yeah. we'll come back to that. So, yeah, yeah. so that's the truth things. And then there's this morality thing. So first of all, and this is a big one because for us, it seems like our emotions are what kind of motivates us to act certain ways. And so we mm -hmm. want to have that at least. And then there's this also like, hey, if your emotions reveal or the emotions can reveal, you know, virtues or flaws in your character, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the motivation is really important. Uh, I didn't get into that a lot um, in, in what I just, just said to you. But yeah, uh, your most, a lot of your moral actions, the motivations are your emotions because your emotions, again, are evaluations of, of situations. So, so yeah, a lot of times your moral, your, the reasons for your moral actions are emotions because yeah. they're responding, emotionally responding to situations. So yeah, gotcha. if you want to understand someone's actions, you want to understand their emotions. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to give you just, a, I'm going to shoot a couple of listener questions to you that mm -hmm. I think just related to what you said. Uh, cool. Matthew Graham says, are you familiar with Robert Roberts' view of emotions, uh, which you I think you just referenced, and he says, yeah. uh, what do you think of emotions as concerns based on construals? Um, and do you think this is compatible with Thomism? Uh, Graham, we'll come back. We'll come to that because we're going to speak about that in the next question. But yeah, you want to talk a little bit more about Robert's view? Yeah. So Robert's, um, so his view is really close to what I articulated. Um, but so he calls emotions concern based construals. And so again, I said like your emotions are grounded what you care about or you're concerned with. And so again, and so Roberts is going to say like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you're, what you're concerned with is what you think is worth your attention yeah. and worth, uh, acting on behalf of. And then I, when I said uh, an, an emotion is like an evaluation, it's like a, some kind of mental representation of seeing the world a particular way and having certain values. Yeah. That's what a construal is, mm -hmm. uh, according to Roberts. You're looking at the world and construing it a particular way. You're seeing it as having certain values um, and and you're judging things according to, you know, your concerns and those grounded in your concerns. Yeah. So so it's that's yeah. So the, the, the view I've articulated is really close to Roberts. It's not tracking all the language he uses, but it's yeah. really close. Yeah. yeah. And this is just kind of an unrelated follow up question. Did you uh, read any? I, what, what are the specialists in this area called? Uh, so a lot of people in philosophy of motion. Um, yeah, it's just, just philosophy of motion. Yeah. Okay. So um, so Roberts was like one person I read a lot of. Uh, there's this other guy named Bennett Helm that was really good. Um, and then... Um, well, my question was going to uh, be like about these people. Are any of them oh, yeah. talking about humor? Like as an emotion? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are. Um, so there's a whole literature on this. I didn't get into it because... So there's this debate about how many emotion types there are. Um, and so these, they have these different like debates about there's, eight, there's like nine emotion types, eight emotion types. And so they'll try to identify these. And so humor, like laughing, like that seems like that is, that could, that's like one example of an emotion type. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it's, you're judging something to be humorous and the, and then it's something, there's just something that is like to laugh, uh, and find something humorous. Yeah. So that seems like, yeah, that should be a clear example of an emotion. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just wondering because I feel like when I read the New Testament, at least Jesus and Paul, there's some things that I certainly think like, oh, they probably found that funny. And I think I find it funny, but I don't mm -hmm. know if it's a backwards emotion to find certain things funny because it's like you're laughing because you're not supposed to, to laugh at it. You know? Right. Yeah. And then I know there's a whole literature on that uh, related to like swearing and like dirty jokes and yeah. like which jokes are funny, what makes the context like appropriate to laugh at and not. So I know there's a whole literature out there on it. Okay. I just haven't dug that deep into it. Okay, I didn't know if you could add any uh, insight to, <laughs> to my maybe immature uh, sense of humor. Uh, so, so let's move on to impassibility. Why don't you just define what is impassibility? Mm -hmm. So impassibility makes three claims. So the first claim is it is impossible for God to suffer. But then you might ask, well, why is it impossible for God to suffer? And the impassible is like, well, I've got two more claims uh, to help you understand this. Okay. So the second claim is it is impossible for God to be moved or influenced by anything outside of himself. Okay. So nothing outside of God can make God think, feel, uh, act, or be in any particular way. Okay. And that's a really strong claim. So, uh, and I, I can't emphasize that enough. 
the third claim is that um, God can have any emotion that is consistent with his perfect rationality, mm -hmm. his perfect goodness, and then his perfect happiness. And so the happiness, that's what explains why he can't suffer. Because if God can't have any emotion that's inconsistent with his happiness, then, well, of course, you know, he's not going to suffer. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. so you can stop there. So, yeah, yeah. so it, the, the major claim is that we want to say God can't suffer, right? Yeah. And that's related to kind of, or supported by these other claims that, so we don't want a God that is influenced. And I, I guess I could see some ways in which you might want that. Um, but you don't want him influenced in any way. So you want like whatever kind of influence you might think of, God can't have that. Right. Okay. So, and he has to have emotions that are consistent with, for the most part, his happiness, but the other two were, the other two criteria were what? So rationality and okay. goodness. Okay. Because you want to say God's perfectly rational, right? And uh -huh. you want to say he's perfectly good. So can God like have like jealousy? You know, okay, well, Newton, the Old Testament seems like that. Okay, well, yeah. is it rational to be jealous? Hmm, okay. Is it good to be jealous? You're going to have to think about that a bit. Um, what about lust uh, or pride or mm -hmm. like some of these other kind of things? Um, when you look at a lot of the early church fathers, they're going to go, well, that's irrational or that would be immoral to have yeah. that, that yeah. emotion. So God can't have that. Yeah. Um, so they'll, they'll have, so they have these criteria for trying to rule out a bunch of different emotions. Yeah. Yeah. And so let's talk a little bit about these, these, um, these three, right? So mm -hmm. the, the first one is rationality. Like that makes sense to me. And I feel like for the others, there may be ways like on which you kind of put them on a spectrum and say, well, if you mean this, then yeah. But for rationality, it seems like, well, the both the past. Oh, we kind of skipped over the doctrine of God thing, but both uh, the, okay. the, the classical theists and the neoclassical theists are going to want to say that um, his emotions are going to be consistent with his perfect rationality. So mm -hmm. in what ways might there be difference between these two models when it comes to that criterion? Um, and then I guess describe the difference between the neoclassical theist and the classical theist models. Yeah. So I'll, let me say what the neoclassical theist is going to say uh, about passability. Mm -hmm. And then we can see some of these differences a bit more tighter. So we've got these three claims from impassibility saying can't suffer, cannot be moved or influenced by anything outside of himself. And then no emotion that's inconsistent with perfect rationality, perfect goodness, and perfect happiness. So the passibilist is going to say, I'll make three parallel claims. So I'll say God can suffer. It is possible for God to suffer. You know, it just depends on the situation. Uh, second, it is possible for God to be moved or influenced by things outside of himself. Like he really can be moved and influenced to some extent in various ways. No. Uh, not all, like all across the board, but you know, he can be moved and influenced. Third, they're going to say like, yeah, that's right. God can can have any emotion that's consistent with his perfect rationality, his perfect goodness. They want to agree on that with the classical theist. Mm -hmm. But then they're going to say, but God can have emotions that are inconsistent with being perfectly happy because sometimes the right response, the rational response, the, the, the good response is to be upset or sad or angry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here would be an example. So part of what it means to be perfectly rational is that you are appropriately responsive to values mm -hmm. or reasons. Because uh, moral reason, uh, moral values are reasons for acting. Uh, you could have other kinds of reasons for acting uh, or feeling or <clears throat> being in particular ways. Um, but so goodness and rationality come together in this sort of way because being responsive to reasons, yeah. moral reasons are, are mm -hmm. reasons. Well, say again, we'll go back to that Aquinas example of if, if you are a perfectly virtuous person mm -hmm. and you witness something really tragic, well, what's the virtuous thing to do? To be upset. Mm -hmm. Well, God's perfectly rational and he's going to be appropriately responsive to the moral values in that situation. And so he's morally good. Well, he's going to be upset. Yeah. Uh, so when he sees something really horrible and really tragic, God's going to be upset. So it's so of course he's not going to be perfectly happy because it would be irrational to be really happy to like say like you were witnessing like some of the horrible horrible tragedies that happened during World War II and be like you're perfectly happy that's it that's not rational yeah that's not moral and that's 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 what the pastoralist is going to say yeah yeah so uh, yeah why don't you well I guess I'll, I'll bring up my question about omniscience right now since we're kind of talking about that yeah um, so. For me, I guess the the thing that's kind of like a hang up for me, and maybe you can kind of help me even clarify what, what it is that I might be um, uh, uh, miss or maybe not thinking rightly about, is that if God is omniscient, then he's always going to have all of these propositions in view, right? So including the proposition of, you know, anything from the resurrection to the Holocaust to, you know, the final judgment where he throws Hitler to hell, you know, for, yeah, for eternity, sure. right? So, so it, it's, it's to me, for God to not be 
I, I, kind of getting rid of the notion of happy. Um, it, it, it kind of, it, it doesn't make sense for me to think of God being disturbed because in order for God's emotional life to be disturbed, I would almost want to say that that can only make sense if these things weren't in view, um, you know, the set of propositions weren't in view and then they came into view. So does that make sense? I don't know if I'm going anywhere with that, but yeah, the rationality no. criterion is, yeah. Yeah, no, I, see, I know exactly what you're talking about because there are open theists who want to run an argument exactly like this. So, the, so there's open theists like uh, William Hasker and Richard Rice who are going to go, okay, so say you want to affirm passability because you actually read your Bible. Good good for you. Yeah. Uh, and this is the way like Hasker will kind of talk. Um, and he's like, but you still want to believe that God knows the future. You know, um, He knows like the, the end from the, the beginning. You know, it's all this kind of stuff. And Hasker's like, well, how could you really make sense of God being passable and having different emotions at different times if he really does like know all the things that are going to happen? Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can run an argument like that um, based on God having this exhaustive foreknowledge and go, that doesn't really seem consistent with passability. And for Hasker, he's going to say, since we know that mm -hmm. passability is true based on scripture, yeah. then you should get rid of the exhaustive foreknowledge. That's gotcha. where Hasker and Rice want to go. So I think this is an interesting argument. Um, here's where I want to push back, though. So I want to say if God's really omniscient, he's going to be uh, responsive to lots of different kinds of facts. One sort of fact that your emotions are often based on are tensed facts, facts about what's happening right now, mm -hmm. okay. uh, and, and facts about what will happen and what has happened. Okay. Uh, so what's happening right now, well, that's a big impact on the emotions you have. Mm -hmm. So say I'm, uh, so this is an argument that Ian Pryor kind of runs. Um, okay. Uh, so Ann Pryor has this argument that says, like, uh, so say I'm really anxious about, like, an upcoming meeting, you know, like, so say I'm, like, really anxious about talking to you, Nicholas, you know, I'm like, oh, gosh, I'm really nervous about this. Yeah, that's how I felt. That's uh, how I felt. <laughs> yeah, right. And you're like, I'm going to be talking to Dr. R.T. Mullins. Like, that's horrible. You know, oh, my gosh, like, it's going to be so, so nervous. What if I say something stupid? Uh, and then, like, so one of your friends comes and is like, well, well, you know, like, think about the fact, though, that, like, you know, um, your, your, your appointment with, like, Dr. Mullins, your interview with Dr. Mullins, that takes place at 930 you know, um, on, on, a on April 4th, uh, 2021, uh, doesn't that give you some sort of solace about this? And you're like, well, no, because I'm nervous about the fact that it's happening in five minutes. <clears throat> you know, like, I don't care about this, like this, the fact that it just happens at this particular time and date. I'm not worried about that. It's about to happen like really soon. Okay. Um, and so after the interview's done and this is all gone really well because, you know, like this seems like it's going pretty well. So I, I, I feel confident to predict that it's going to be well in the end afterwards. You can say, thank goodness that's over. You know, like, I'm really pleased with that. Oh, you've got okay. some sort of response to how it went. Gotcha. Gotcha. Because you're responding to what's what's happening right now. Yeah. And what just happened. So there's these tense facts, and that's what your emotions are really responding to. Gotcha. Well, God's going to be the same way, because God knows what time it is now, uh, if you think God's temporal, um, yeah, like the neoclassical theist does. And <laughs> so God's going to be responding to what's happening right now. Um, he's going to know certain things are coming soon, mm -hmm. but that could create all sorts of emotional responses, such as anxiety, um, yeah. a little bit of nervousness, yeah. um, maybe some excitement because, Ooh, Hey, like I'm about to do this really cool resurrection thing, guys, just wait for it. Wait for <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a lot of like kind of emotions that are going to be again, responding to the different tensed facts that are there in the world. Yeah. Okay. Good, good, good. So, uh, just back, that does help a lot. I, I want to ask you a question about counter facts, <laughs> you know, which is, mm. you know, I think we're both, uh, members of the Molinist Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I guess, have you given any thought? No, you know what? I'm going to have another question about God's emotional life before creation or before. Okay, sure. Creation. So, so I'll, I'll ask that then because maybe yeah, it'll yeah. go right there. Um, okay. So, uh, all right. So, so God's impassibility, we're going to talk about God not being able to suffer, not being able to be influenced by anything that you could possibly imagine. <laughs> and uh, uh, his happiness will be consistent with his rationality, his goodness, and his uh, happiness. So um, what is going to motivate somebody to adopt this doctrine because I think for most people who are just uh, really not into metaphysics or, you know, philosophical theology, they don't see the point. So what, what motivates mm. this doctrine? Yeah. So we'll think about it this way. Like you want to be happy, right? Like, I mean, everybody wants to be happy, you know? Um, well, how do you get happiness? And the classical thesis is like, I've got a story to tell you. You want to be happy. You need to be in a right relationship with the greatest possible good. And we all agree that God's the greatest possible good. Uh, who's going to deny that? Okay. Well, so that means you need to be in a right relationship with God. Uh, now, if you, and so God is in the right relationship with the greatest possible good because he is the greatest possible good. Okay. So of course he's going to be happy, you know, like that's just, that's just how it works. Um, so God just gets the happiness for free because he is the greatest possible good. Okay. And now you might be going, well, that doesn't fully convince me. And they're like, well, okay, I've got a little bit more to tell you. 
if God were to evaluate certain things as worthy of his attention uh, and worthy of his action, that would somehow move him from the state of pure, undisturbable bliss and happiness? Well, what the classical theist says at that point is, well, then God would be making a false evaluation. He'd be judging something to be better than the greatest good, something better than himself. Yeah, for sure. And well, that's just, that's, well, God can't do that. He's, he's all knowing. He couldn't yeah. possibly make a false evaluation like that. Yeah. So, so of course, yeah. And then you will see that that's why the classical theist will th say things like, well, God's knowledge is all self-knowledge mm -hmm. because his knowledge has to be based on, he couldn't, because he can't be influenced by you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And all of God's love is self-love. All of God's uh, actions, therefore his own goodness, his own glory. Mm -hmm. um, so of course, like it's all grounded in himself. And that's what you should expect from this being that's perfectly happy and, and is in a state of pure, undisturbed happiness. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess I'll ask the question about God's pre-creation, like <laughs> emotional life. Or, you sure, know, so sure. before God, you know, so so we're going to say, even if you think God is temporal, that there was a time, um, I guess, when God didn't have creation, right? So mm -hmm. we're, we're going to want to agree to creation out of nothing at some point in the past. Um, now, with that in mind, I guess I struggle to understand how God's emotions, because <clears throat> you like to say emotions are evaluations, you know, um, mm -hmm. and then with these evaluations comes cares and concerns, and then we decide to act. Well, if we think of that action as being his decree to create, then what is the care or concern that God has uh, before creation? So, like, it seems like to me, at least God is impassable without creation mm -hmm. and then passable with creation. If that, that's kind of the idea that I would have. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, and I can and I can even help you out a little bit further. So when you look at people like open theists like Keith Ward, they're going to and, 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 and William Hasker, um, they're both going to say before creation. God's in a state of pure happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're going to be like, so this really does like make it, you know, you can really see then why God really does have this choice of, do I have to create? I don't have to create if I don't want to. I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly happy. Mm -hmm. Do I really want to create a universe where I could possibly suffer? Uh, and so you might say, well, is he, is he impassable before creation and then he becomes passable? Well, no, because remember, impassibility is a, is a very strong modal claim. It's saying it's impossible for God to be influenced by anything outside of himself. It's impossible for God to suffer. So it's not based on just his context. It's just impossible, full stop. Mm -hmm. So if God creates stuff, he would still be the case that he can't be influenced by anything outside of himself if mm -hmm. he's really impassable. Or if he's passable, he can. That's, that is a possibility. Something about his nature is such that he is able to be influenced by things if he creates things that, you know, because say he wants to create stuff that he can interact with and yeah. be influenced by him. That's a possibility because of something about God's nature. Okay. Something about the emotional life of God, it already has these things built in from the start that it is possible to be influenced by other okay. things. Okay, so even if it hasn't been influenced yet, you could say, well, on passability, that doesn't matter as long as it's possible that it's influenced. And, and then you have the game for passability. Oh, okay, so <clears throat> I guess my my other question then would be, what does that emotion look like? Like, does, like I'd imagine that God would recognize he's alone. <laughs> you know, like yeah. the passable yeah. God recognizes he's lonely and he decides he needs, you know, to create. That's what some people run these arguments. I'm not convinced by anybody in this particular, what I'm about to say. Um, so some people will say, uh, this is the explanation for why God creates is because he's lonely or something. Yeah. That might be the emotion he has. And I'm like, I don't know. Um, and then people who are like Trinitarian, like so a lot of open theists, they're going to say, well, well, no, he's like he's Trinitarian. Um, so he's not lonely. You got three persons there. How are you going to be lonely uh, uh, in that state? Um, so they'll run these kind of arguments. I don't really know what to do with any of that either way. Um, I do want to say this, though. So the classical theist says that God is the perfect realization of all possible values or of all possible goods. So there is literally no way for God to create more value or more goodness because God's already fully realized it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that entails that God literally has no reason to create a universe at all. Uh, okay. And so I'm like, well, the universe exists. So either God performed an arbitrary action or maybe God just doesn't exist. Like, ooh, okay. Yeah. Um, that seems bad. And mm -hmm. so whereas I think if you're a passivalist, you could say, well, let, that's just false. Like God is the greatest possible good, but... There's certain values, uh, certain good things that God cannot realize by himself, such as, um, you know, the the value of creating stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you can't have that if you hadn't created anything. The value of entering into a friendship with creatures. Mm -hmm. You can't have that value unless you create stuff. And so there's certain kind of like relational values um, uh, of like friendship. There's certain aesthetic values of like creating a universe that's got like, you know, certain kind of beauty to it. And those are certain values that you just cannot have unless God actually performs an action. So it's not that a guy's like lonely or something. It would be more of like, I've got the power to do all sorts of things 
And, the, and like if any of those would be a bringing about a very particular kind of good thing or value into the world. Mm -hmm. And so those would be the reasons why God would create. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So he can have these positive evaluative judgments of, oh, what? so I guess would that make the world better in that case? You know, like in that, in that possible world where God decided to create, is God the creator better um, or, you know, or, uh, a, a greater possible being than God who, you know, didn't act on that evaluative judgment? There are people who run arguments like this. Um, and so William Rowe has got a really f uh, famous argument of this sort, where it seems like if God's going to create, he has to create the best possible world, because otherwise there's a better action he could have performed. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't believe in the best possible world, which I don't, um, then it seems like, well, then he couldn't possibly perform, you know, whatever action he performs, he could have always done better. Well, then he's, then he's not somehow like perfect or something is the idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people just want to reject that idea. They want to go, well, he's just perfect full stop. Um, and what would a perfect being do? Well, he's going to do things that are possible, um, mm -hmm. but it's impossible for you to fully uh, realize all of the different things that you could do. Yeah. Um, and so this is actually discussed a lot in ethics literature that has nothing to do with philosophy or religion. And so this is kind of like an assumed principle that like, yeah, it's just impossible to like realize all these different values um, because you just can't maximize your value because if you perform one action, that rules out a different kind of action. Okay. So th there's going to be these worlds on par with one another and in, in mm -hmm. which different actions are taken and God could just kind of choose from those worlds. I like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's, 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 that's an ongoing project I'm working on. So I don't have the best way to kind of popularize yeah. and explain it at the moment. But yeah, that's, that's, that's one thing I'm working well, on. Well, I think that kind of gets into the question of counterfactuals, right? I mean, mm -hmm. like you can say, you know, I guess if we're talking to Molinist literature, that maybe there's this, this range of feasible worlds um, which God knows these counterfacts and he, you know, allows his evalu uh, emotional uh, evaluative judgments to kind of say these are first tier, second tier, you know, third tier worlds, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, so that, that would be exactly it. And so that's what you see in the literature from people will say that's that kind of universe would be one that's not worth creating. So it's not creation worthy universe. And this other one's got a lot of good making properties. So it is a creation worthy universe. Yeah. Um, and so those are part of the evaluations that the uh, judgments that God's making. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, so to just kind of retrace, we got these three criteria that we want for an impassable God, um, these three criteria for the kinds of emotions he's going to have. And then we're talking a little bit about what might motivate this. And that is, we want a God who is happy all the way happy at all the times, you know? Yeah. So, all right. So, so let's move on to passability. You already spoke a little bit about the three criteria or, you know, uh, definition of passability. Would you talk, uh, just recap, uh, what is passability and then talk a little bit about omnisubjectivity? Yeah. So again, passability says it's possible for God to suffer. That is a real possibility. And it is possible for God to be moved or influenced by things outside of himself. So if he creates a universe mm -hmm. with like a particular kind of creatures, he's like, yeah, I can be influenced by them. Um, and it's, and God has any emotion that's consistent with his perfect rationality, his perfect goodness. Um, but sometimes it's going to entail God being sad or suffering or being angry, depending on what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, um, impassibility says God cannot have any empathy whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe metaphorically, but yeah. definitely not literally. Um, now, passability, everyone in the passability camp says, yes, God has empathy. Mm -hmm. How much empathy, though? It's not really clear. Um, seems like they want to say that God has the, the greatest amount of empathy possible, but what is that greatest amount? Yeah. And this is where omnisubjectivity comes in. So Linda Zygzewski, she says, omnisubjectivity is God's perfect, total empathetic grasp of all creaturely conscious states. Okay. So any conscious state you have, any sort of feeling you have, even like moods that you might be in, um, God's got a perfect empathetic grasp of that. I haven't told you what empathy is yet, but that's okay. But this is the, this is the, this is the claim, at least for omni subjectivity. Uh -huh. Okay, gotcha. So yeah, yeah you want to tell me what? <laughs> tell me yeah, what so empathy is. Tell me what empathy is. So <laughs> here's what empathy is. So um, empathy involves three things. So so like I empathize with you if I know that you have some sort of emotion. Um, say like you're excited because this interview is super exciting. Okay, yeah. Uh, and so I'm like, yeah, I know Nicholas is like uh, is excited, um, but then also I know what it's like to be excited. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, I know what it's like to have that emotion. And then third, something about my interaction with you, something about, like, who you are and, like, how we're interacting with each other, on the basis of that, I'm able to understand this is what it's like for Nicholas to feel excited. Okay, so you're and kind so of combining that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so when I get all three of those, when I combine all those, then I've achieved a state of empathy. 
Okay, so so passability is going to have not being able to suffer, or can suffer, can be moved, um, and you're going to have emotions that are consistent with his uh, rationality and goodness. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're going to most like the, the, the claim of uh, him being perfect bliss, that's the claim that we're going to kind of like back away from a little bit, right? And um, like, well, no, no one wants to back away from perfect. Everybody wants to say God's perfect. Oh, bliss, bliss, like oh, bliss. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah all yeah. of his emotions like, are consistent with his perfect. Bliss right, bliss. yeah, because they're gonna be like, well, sometimes it's just, yeah, he's definitely not gonna be happy. And okay. like Proverbs says, like, uh, you know, God feels indignation every day towards sin. And that yeah. doesn't look like you know, <laughs> perfect happiness. Like, right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so so on empathy, and we're gonna have some kind of empathy. So God, yes. everyone's gonna want to say God empathizes somehow. That includes mm-hmm. that He knows you're feeling away. Uh, what it's like to feel that way and that he knows that you are feeling that way, essentially, right? Or what it's like for you to feel that way. Oh, or what it's like for you to feel that way. Okay. Yeah. All right. So omnisubjectivity is going to bring in the stronger claim that he has a perfect grasp of everyone's conscious state. So he's kind of like actively empathizing with everyone at all times. Yes. Okay. So that seems problematic, right? But I don't know what the alternative is to that. Right? So, yeah. So I guess can you can you paint me a picture of the the spectrum of empathy mm-hmm. that we could have for God? Because I'd imagine yeah. that a, a completely uh, this kind of goes back to the omniscient thing that I was thinking about. A God who is completely rational it, to me, like if I'm completely rational, I may be like completely upset at all times, you know, until the end or something like that. Right. These seems like these might be cases. Um, right. So. So the first thing, uh, first option I noticed was, um, bef- like when you get to the very turn, like of the 20th century, like early 20th century, uh, the different pacifists I noticed, like Francis McConnell and Bertrand Brasnett, or some of the first like really big figures to really kind of push this agenda, they say like there's certain things God cannot empathize with. So certain like sins are just so wicked that yeah. God just couldn't really have the, a grasp of what it's like for you to delight in in those kind of sins. Okay. Gotcha. So they'll say he knows that you 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 are delighting in the sense. So he knows that you have the emotion, yeah. but he doesn't know what it's like yeah. really fully in the, in the, like, to this full extent. Yeah. So some of them, you might be able to have some kind of like a uh, little bit of the, the grasp of the affect of what it's like to have that. Um, and some others, you might just be like, I just can't uh, because I'm because there are certain moral limits yeah. or rational limits on mm-hmm. what God can empathize with. Okay. Yeah. That's part of the claim. Um, and then more recently, like uh, John Peckham, uh, in some of his work, when he's just looking at just the biblical understanding of what it means for God to be loving, uh, he looks at a bunch of the claims about God being rich in mercy, rich in compassion, rich in empathy in the biblical text. And he tries to point to some different cases where he says, there are certain cases where God's mercy or God's uh, compassion or empathy, uh, God just says, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, yeah. You've you violated the covenant one too many times. And so... Yeah. Not gonna, not gonna empathize with you right now. Not gonna show any compassion right now. Yeah. And so God's got some kind of voluntary control. So it's not just like mm-hmm. automatic. Like I just, oh, I just can't help it. I'm just empathizing with everybody. Um, it's, it's more. There's some kind of voluntary control here. Yeah. Is, is, is the way Peckham's thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess in that sense, instead of thinking of emotions as being these things that are always moving, God, God is acting. God can act for you know or towards these different emotions that mm-hmm. He wants to kind of display. So like maybe as a parent, I want to display my mercy to my son. And in another case, maybe I want to display that, you know, like, hey, I am pretty judgmental of your <laughs> behavior. And yeah. uh, OK, gotcha. And his rationality is going to kind of maybe uh, limit what those uh, maybe wicked emotions will be like. Yeah, there's a little bit more you could say, too. So when I empathize with you, if I achieve that state of empathy of going, this is exactly what it's like for Nicholas to feel this way about this situation. Yeah. The next step is there's what's called empathetic response. And so in a lot of the empathy literature, they'll talk about how, well, yeah, you might achieve empathy with somebody. Well, but then so what? Um, Like, what are you going to do with that? Well, there's lots of ways you could respond. Your empathetic response could be, yeah, I don't, I don't really care about the things you care about. Um, I find you boring and dull. So I'm just going to go do something else. Yeah, that's a possibility. Yeah. Uh, Or I could be like, you're really gross. Uh, I don't want to be around you. Uh, Or I'm going to judge you. Or it could be like, I, 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 I share I share your feelings on this situation. Okay, yeah. Those are all possible responses to achieving a state of empathy with someone. Okay, so, so I mean, I guess in that case, we could say, like, maybe God experiences or he has empathy for some of these wicked, uh, wicked emotions or states, but he has a negative assessment of them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, that's right. exactly what Zygzebski says. She says, because God has a perfect grasp of all your conscious states, Therefore, he's going to be the perfect judge because he's got all the possible, like, relevant knowledge 
He knows exactly what you're thinking, exactly why you did what you did, what exactly why you're yeah. feeling the way you did. And and on the basis of that, then God can go, I know all the moral re- morally relevant facts now. Yeah. I know all the salient facts, and so I can really judge you appropriately. Yeah. So my my other question just on this topic, we'll move to the mm-hmm. the topic of love and wrath. Okay. Is there just more people like John Peckham in the world? <laughs> like, do we have because because this guy is like acquainted, like, I mean, he's doing like biblical theology, mm-hmm. right? But yeah. he, he knows what you're talking about. <laughs> so, yes. Um, where, where are the other is... biblical scholars like that? So one of the things that John and I are starting to do, we're creating a new book series that's going to be just on the doctrine of God. And the hope is to get more people to um, start weighing in on doing biblical theology and being really aware of like philosophical and systematic issues too. Yeah. Uh, and so we can try to like create some new ground in on the, in the doctrine of God. So it's a, that's a, a forthcoming project that, that yeah. um, Peck and I are working on. Yeah, you guys should start uh, the Mullins Peckham like grant society for mm-hmm. for people to to, to major in uh, biblical and philosophical studies. Like that's kind of my goal. So you guys can make me your first candidate because I want to do, <laughs> yeah, I want to do my philosophical studies and then get into like exegetical studies um, because mm-hmm. that's what's most useful in the church is the exegesis. And so right, seems um, like it's kind of, it's kind of important. Seems like yeah. it should be. You know, so, so Peckham to me is just like a showstopper. Like, yeah, you guys are saying all this, but here's what the Bible says, and like, you can't get away from these parts of it. You know, yeah. yeah. Anyways, I think that's a great idea. I would love to see that book series. That would be really helpful to the church. Um, okay, so uh, let's talk about love and wrath, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So, how does the impassable God love? <laughs> what does He want to do with His love? What does He desire for love? You know. Right. So there's a lot of different objections. And so the typical objections is go like, well, look, God just can't care about you if he's impassable because he can't be moved or influenced by you. So he just can't care. So he can't love you. Full stop. Game over. And yeah. then when you start quoting a bunch of classical theists saying, yeah, God's love is only self-love, then it's like, well, right. Yeah, he really can't care about me then, you know, <laughs> um, and they'll and they'll push back and be like, yeah, that's a caricature. And I'm like, you said his, his love is only self-love. How is that a caricature? Yeah. OK, fine. Fine, I'm caricaturing. Tell me more. Tell me more. And so they'll be like, "Here's more." Well, God's love isn't is it involves two desires. Uh, so there's more to the story of God's love. So these two desires are you want to you have the desire for the good of the beloved. So like, if I love you, then like I want what's best for you. I want to do yeah. good things for you. I want to make sure you like you know, have a good life. Yeah. The second thing is a desire for unity with the beloved. Mm-hmm. So I want to be close to you, like personally close to you. Yeah. If I love you, like you know that's that's, that's you know we want to be like have this personal close relationship. And so the so people who affirm impassibility will be like, we affirm both of these desires. So this is what's involved with God's love. What's wrong with that? Mm-hmm. And you can go, well, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, I don't think you can satisfy, I don't think an impassable God can satisfy those conditions. Yeah. Here's here's one reason for that. Okay. Uh, the classical tradition also says God cannot have any desires um, because God is the perfect realization of all possible goods. So there's nothing, yeah. there's no other goods to realize. So there's nothing for God to desire. So if God can't have desires, well, then, it, then start talking about God having desires. It's like, well, God cannot have desires. And now you're telling me in order for God to be loving, he has to have desires. We've ruled out God being loving then. Yeah. Ooh. So we, we haven't even got the conversation started and we've already lost. Like, this is not good. <laughs> this is bad. Like, ooh, yeah. Um, so, uh, so, we, so I point that out in the book and then I'm like, well, maybe they've got some way to wiggle around that. Maybe they do. I don't know. I don't know what it could be, but, you know, well, yeah. maybe it's possible. And so when you start looking at Eleanor Stumps, so she's really trying to articulate this in a lot more detail. Yeah. I she saw her said, give this talk in New Orleans at the uh, oh, good. Loyola. In, uh, yeah, at Loyola. Um, she talked about love and then Aquinas and love and then uh, another talk at the same time. Uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. But yeah, anyways, I'm sorry. I never... Yeah, no, no, no. Yes, yeah, Stumps great. She's, she's a fun speaker. She's a very energetic kind of person. She's very feisty. Um, and so she'll say like, okay, if you want to be like personally close with someone, First thing is you need to be aware of each other that that you and uh, that each other are persons, which so I'm aware that you're a person. You're aware that I'm a person. Okay. We at least need to have that in order to be personally close. Yeah, yeah. But that's not really that much though. Um, yeah, because, yeah. Because like there's I, I you know like, I like went for a walk earlier today and I saw some people and I, we were like you know we locked eyes and we saw like hey mate you know I see you're a person and I'm like yes I acknowledge that you are a person as well. We're not close. What else do you need? Well, it needs to be the case that I reveal a bunch of my uh, about who I am stuff who I am to you. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because if I don't reveal who I am to you, then we're not going to be close. So I got to be willing to reveal who I am to you. Okay. But if you can't comprehend that, if you can't understand the stuff I'm revealing to you about myself. Oh, okay. Well, then you're not going to be close to me, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you need to understand who I am okay. to some extent. You got to comprehend who I am. Yeah. The deeper your comprehension, the deeper the, the closeness we can have. 
but that's not all though because like it also like you maybe have like perfect comprehension of who i am and you're just like that guy's an, like he's just a jerk i don't i don't i don't, don't want to have anything to do with him yeah, yeah um so you need to accept who i am to some extent okay yeah and now uh so that's all like good and well so the deeper the comprehension the like the the, the better you're going to be able to have some kind of personal relationship and you got to have this acceptance yeah uh david efford uh has a, a recent paper in the analytic theology handbook the tnt clark handbook to analytic theology yeah called analytic spirituality okay if you find a free copy of that please let me know <laughs> yeah, okay um, <laughs> go ahead go ahead so, so um he says like that's cool but that's not enough because if you really want to know someone well there's some other criteria and one of the other criteria he points out is hmm. um if uh, like i'm revealing myself to you and you've understood you know you've got some deep comprehension uh -huh. of like what it, but it also has to be the case that i can't be deceptive in the, what i've revealed to you about myself okay so yeah because like yeah if i'm if i'm lying to you like you might think like you know mm -hmm. oh, you know like we're really good like you know, right now really close really tight and then and then eventually you find out i've been lying to you well yeah. then you're gonna be like I don't know this guy at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you're not, you've never been close because you, uh -huh. I guess I've been deceiving you this whole time. Mm -hmm. So that could be like a, a barrier to close relationship. So here's where you can go with the love argument against impassibility. So you can go first step, and this is what I do in the book, um, is to go, well, let's focus in on that deep comprehension. Can God really have a deep comprehension of, of, of me, of what it's like to be me? Mm -hmm. Well, no, because he can't be in, moved or influenced by anything outside of himself. So he's going to, he's not going to be able to understand what it's like to be me because that would involve him, Influ you know, being, being influ influenced by me. Mm -hmm. Further, he can't know what it's like to have a whole range of emotions that you and I have. So, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I've never been in a state of pure, undisturbable happiness. Yeah. Most of my emotions are like not about myself. They're about other things. Mm -hmm. um, but God can only understand emotions that are about himself and that are consistent with his pure undisturbed happiness okay so any emotion that you have that is not based on yourself and that is not a a, a pure undisturbed happiness god cannot have any comprehension of what that is like yeah so he can't so all the, the most personal <laughs> things about you he just can't you know he can't know at all he can't understand them yeah the, the reasons why you do anything that you do the reasons that you okay. act in the ways that you act the way they feel that all the god, god can't have any of that yeah. and so you're like well then you're not gonna be that close mm -hmm. Here's what I'm doing in a new paper, though, that I'm working on, is to focus okay. on, well, that deception thing. Um, so yeah. if, like, because, like, yeah, that's really bad. It's like, you know, if God's deceiving you, then, like, oh, my gosh, what, what is this jerk that I'm, like, worshiping? Um, well, when you look at all those biblical texts about, like, God being rich in mercy and compassion and, and all that stuff, it's like, well, he literally has, like, empathy. That's like, that's like, you know, it's a pretty big biblical theme. And you're like, okay, cool. So he's revealing himself this way. Oh, yeah. And the impassibilist tradition says, yes, that's right. He does, in fact, reveal himself that way. Why? Well, because you couldn't understand. You're just too dumb to understand impassibility. So yeah. he has to reveal himself to you as if he has empathy in order to draw you closer to him. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, so God intentionally reveals himself to me mm -hmm. as the exact opposite, as the exact contradictory opposite of what he is like in order to draw me closer to him. Yeah. Well, that's deceptive. Yeah. And that's also really manipulative. Yeah. Um, it just it, it feels like God's catfishing me. And I'm like, <laughs> is that really loving? Okay. I, so you see, you kind of see like this is where the struggle would be to say, is that really, is that really loving anymore at this point? Okay. So, so to just kind of recap, <laughs> recap sure, all yeah. the steps that we've taken. Uh, so, so we want to grant the impassibilist mm. their definition of love. So uh, yes. uh, Eleanor Stump, desire for the goodness of the other and unity with one another, right? Um, but that obviously uh, requires, you know, a little bit of unpacking. So we could just say, well, you know, um, passable God has no desires whatsoever. So you can't even have that. But uh, even if we unpack it with, you know, this awareness and uh, this comprehension of what one is revealing about themselves and acceptance, right? Which all seem like good and true. I think that you would you would want those in a, a definition of love. Um, <clears throat> you got a few problems. Okay, so. So there isn't really any comprehension going on because we can't, I mean, God isn't influenced by anything about us. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's nothing about God that we can relate to whatsoever mm -hmm. um, because of that second clause where we talked about uh, <laughs> what, what we say, everything being consistent with his, his perfect bliss. So there's nothing like that in our experience. Yeah. All right. And then you're going to work on this other argument about that whole no deception clause because it would seem like 
And I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's what Peckham really kind of brings out well. Is like, it seems like a lot of this, not only is it like, it's not just metaphorical, but it, it doesn't apply at all. Like it doesn't latch on to any kind of uh, uh, real thing that we're talking about God when we say that he has mercy or compassion, according to yeah. impassibilism. Exactly. And so what, I, what I've got is some really juicy quotes from different impassibilists being very explicit, saying, yeah, God does not have any empathy, no. but he does reveal himself as having empathy in order to draw you closer. And I'm like, whew. <clears throat> okay. Okay. That's there good. That's go. good. All right, guys, we're coming up on the hour mark. Dr. Mullins, how much, how much time do you have? Are you, I can keep going if you, for a bit longer if you want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I know you guys have put questions in the chat. Just keep putting those. I want to get to our last, th- through our last two questions and then I'll, I'll get to the listener question. So mm-hmm. um, let's talk about wrath, right? So mm-hmm. can the impassable God have wrath? I, I would imagine <laughs> that he should have, he should have it, but can he have it? Right. And so so what I do in the book is I point out that you've got a bunch of classical theists who say God does have wrath. And then you've got some others who want to say, no, he can't literally have it. Um, the ones who want to say that he literally has it, they're like, well, he literally has it because, A, it's a huge biblical theme. It's a major biblical. In the Old Testament alone, over 400 times it talks about God's wrath. And it might be even more depending on how you want to translate a couple different words. Um, so that's just the Old Testament. So like it's very clear that it's a biblical teaching. God has wrath towards sin. He feels indignation every day towards sin. Um, and then some of the other claims from classical theists will be, if you deny that God has wrath, then you are denying that God is perfectly holy and perfectly righteous. Yeah. Okay. And, well, you don't want to do that. So, you know, you better stop being a dirty sinner and admit that God has wrath. Exactly. And so I'm like, okay, <laughs> fine. All right, cool. Uh, so here's what I do then. I'm like, okay, well, why is God mad? Um, it seems like if he's going to have wrath, he's mad because of my son. Yeah. Well, but God can't be moved or influenced by anything outside of himself. So if he's mad because I've sinned, well, then he's being moved or influenced by something outside of himself. He's being okay. moved or influenced by me. And so we're like, okay, there's a there's an inconsistency right there. So you can't, if you're, you're going to say God's impassable, well, he can't be mad at me for my sins. Yeah. And then I then I quote uh, James Dozel, who's uh, a contemporary proponent of impassable ability. And he says, our sins, be they ever so many, have no influence on God. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. So it seems like you're going to have to get rid of wrath. And it seems like if you really wanted to say, well, but if you deny God's wrath, then you're denying God's holiness and righteousness. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it seems like you are. Okay, so you're, that's, that's not good. Well, but what about those classical theists, though, I mentioned they said God only has metaphorical wrath. Okay. Not literal wrath. Like, get rid of that. Because, like, you know, you can't, he gets, you know, you can't have a happy wrath. Like, you, you know, that, that doesn't make any sense. So he's got a metaphorical wrath. I'm like, cool. What is metaphorical wrath? Metaphorical wrath means he doesn't have the feeling of wrath. You know, he's not like feeling indignation. That you know, he can't have to have that because he feels happiness. But he does punish you for your sins. Oh, so it's just an action. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Exactly. And you see this a lot in the classical tradition of saying something's metaphor. God metaphorically has this action because he doesn't have any emotions that go along with it, and his reasons aren't based on these things. But he does have the action. Okay. So that if you saw somebody else do that action, you'd be like, yeah, that's merciful. Okay. But since, yeah, that's the idea. That's I'm like, okay, cool. Why does God punish me, though? What's his reason for punishing me? Mm. Well, it should be because I did something really awful. Like, you know, I was going around setting. I was going around punching people in the face or something, flipping tables, you know, when I shouldn't. Uh, um, well, but hang on. Well, if God punishes me because I did that, then God is being influenced by me. Yeah, He's acting on the basis of something I've done. Yeah. So that's inconsistent, again, with impassibility. So, oh, but do they don't have a, a, a response to that? Is there like uh, not that I options? noticed? Yeah, that's what that's what really shocked me was that they I kept seeing these these backup the backup plan yeah. was this metaphorical move, and I'm like, okay, cool. And I just kept looking at it, and I kept seeing this. It's, it's God being elicited to punish you. God's being like responding to your sin. I kept seeing these kind of claims. And I'm like, but those were all inconsistent with yeah. impassibility. So. Yeah, exactly. And so I've seen this like over the centuries, like seeing people oh. keep saying this. And so I'm like, okay, yeah. surely I'm not the first person to point this out, but. Yeah, yeah that seems like an obvious yeah. gap. <laughs> okay. It does. Yeah. yeah. So we'll have to see how people respond to the book and the argument yeah. in the book. Um, I, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I've, I've had uh, like ongoing conversations with a couple of the professors at SES, which is kind of like a evangelical Thomistic. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's so, a Thomistic breeding ground over there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, I, yeah, I'd I love to have them on and, and maybe have them hash that out. OK, so so you could say, no, God doesn't have wrath. But immediately that seems like to run into this problem. Of, well, then what all this talk about holiness and righteousness? Or you could say he does have wrath, but that's going to lead you into this influence problem. All mm-hmm. right. 
All right. So yeah, there's there's definitely some work to be done there. And you know, I think this is an awesome like gospel uh, a thing because I was thinking about this and I was actually doing some one-on-one discipleship with a friend and uh, we we're talking about God's wrath and we we're talking about specifically like our wrath as men in the church towards kind of um, immoral men, you know, men mm-hmm. who are immoral towards women or towards children and things like that. And he was talking about, yeah, we kind of got into this discussion of like, you know, how can God put up with that? And and on the one hand, I was kind of like, okay, well, let's look at these parts of the Bible where God doesn't put up with that. <laughs> you know, like so God's <laughs> right. gonna, he's going to judge that and uh, he will be judged also. But on the other hand, I was like, one of the ways that he does put up with it in the meantime is the gospel. And so, like, please understand that that wrath isn't something that immediately, I guess, motivates his punishment, but it motivated, you know, sending of his son to die, you know, on our mm-hmm. behalf. And so I thought, I think like that, that's a good gospel. <laughs> gospel it's a good way. gospel message. And you see, but you see it in Hosea as well. And so Hosea is really interesting because it says, um, God says, I will change my mind because I'm not a stubborn man like you are. So you've got this claim of God does change because he's not a man. Why? Because he's like, stubborn men are going to follow through with their anger and wrath, whereas I'm a God who will change my mind because I'm compassionate, precisely because I'm compassionate, unlike you. Yeah. I'm going to have, I'm going to give you a, a plan of uh, mercy instead of a plan of, of wrath. Yeah. So yeah, there really, that is, it is something I think, again, to say about the nature of, the, of God's emotional life is such mm-hmm. that he is really rich in mercy and compassion. And so his wrath is not always going to be just like, just like, let's just kill everyone all across the board. It's going to yeah. be, I'm going to work with you because I really want something yeah. better for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is awesome because it, I mean, I think if you left it in the hands of maybe most Christians, you would imagine that it's like, not like that. (laughs) If you left it in the hands of most Christians, you'd be like, well, yeah, we should just end this right now, Mm -hmm. you know, right after the election or something, you know? Right, yeah. Yeah, if you catch me on a grumpy day, there's going to be a lot of people who are like, no mercy for them. Come on, get rid of them, you know? So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Where thankfully, I'm not God, and God is unlike me. He will change his mind because he is a a God of of mercy instead of a stubborn man like me. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So uh, I could ask the last question about creepy emotions, but you kind of already talked about that. Do you want to add anything else? Can God have creepy emotions? Yeah, so I guess I'll I'll just tease it a little bit more. So the idea is it seems weird to say that God feels everything that you feel. Um, And so the the comic example uh, that Richard Creel gives is, is, does that mean that God's horny? And, and I see people quote that every once in a while. And I thought, like, I'll, I'll just go for it. I'll go ahead and have a really deep discussion on this horny God objection um, because nobody else is doing it. So that'll be fun. Uh, and, and so I tease that out and I tease out some other kind of problems too of like, well, does God know what it's like for you to delight in your sins? Um, does God know what it's like for you to feel stupid uh, or hopeless? And Linda Zygzebski is going to be like, well, omnisubjectivity. So God does. Yeah, he feels all of it. He knows exactly what it's like for you to feel horny. He knows exactly what it's like for you to feel stupid. He knows exactly what it's like for you to delight in your sins. Mm -hmm. And she's like, if you don't like that, get over it. Like, there's no problem here because God's going to respond the way he responds. But it's always rational. It's always going to be rational. Just because he knows what it's like for you and shares in the emotion doesn't mean he agrees with your emotional Mm -hmm. response. Whereas those other people we talked about earlier, they're going to go... But it still feels a little bit creepy. Um, so maybe there's some moral constraints or some rational constraints on the yeah. certain things that he can empathize with. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. she's never been a teenage boy. Yeah, but anyways, yeah. So, yeah. So it, it does seem wrong because even if it's rational, it, it would seem like there's... I don't want to say like some of those emotions are like antithetic, <laughs> antithetical to rationality, but it... It could be like, you know, that some of them are, you know, antithetic with or antithetical to rationality. Well, that's what the horniness example I thought was so interesting, because it was like with the other examples that people would give yeah. that Richard Creel spends more time on, like the sadist example of like the sadist delights in torturing his innocent victim. And you're like, well, that emotion just is wrong. Yeah. And then if you also think that rationality and morality connect up uh, like I do and like he does, he's going to say, well, then it's also irrational. So yeah. if God shares that emotion, you guys being irrational and immoral. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's, and so there's a nice way to explain that away, um, yeah. because you don't have to agree, but like the horny one though, yeah, it's not clear that that's immoral yeah. because there's certain contexts where there's nothing like immoral about being horny and there's nothing irrational about, about that in certain contexts, but something still feels kind of cr- just creepy. That's why I decided to call it the creepy emotions objection, because I was like, it doesn't really fit with yeah. the rationality criteria or the morality, moral criteria. Yeah. It just, some, it just feels kind of gross. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> but, but again, like Zach Zepsky is going to be like, just get over it like yeah yeah and i I guess one of the things that i think i will be like an interesting area to explore would be like the indwelling of the holy spirit you had a 
a lady speaker. And I think that there's mm-hmm. so much to be done there. Who, oh, who yeah. was the professor that you spoke to about that? So I was with uh, Kim Kroll. Um, when I interviewed her, actually, I think it was right before she passed her Viva uh, for her PhD, passed uh-huh. her, her uh, exam. Um, but we went ahead and spoke as if she had passed it because I knew by the time I aired the episode, mm-hmm. she would already. So yeah, so she's, uh, so, so Dr. Kim Kroll, um, she's, yeah, I thought she was doing really interesting work. I had her lecture in some of my classes on the topic. Um, so that's why I had her on the show. Cause I was like, this, this stuff's got to get out there. The idea's yeah. got to get out there. Cause there's not, there's not a lot of good work on the indwelling of the Holy spirit. And yeah. I, and I find that really annoying because that seems like that's really important for Christian thought. Oh my goodness. So, okay. So speaking about the idea of emotions is, you know, I guess that's going to kind of come into play when you're understanding um, what God's emotional life is like, because the third person of the Trinity is indwelling you. And mm-hmm. and she kind of gets into, you know, the different theses that you may want to affirm by indwelling. That seems like you're going to be having some kind of, a, uh, I guess, like interpersonal relationship based on emotions with the third person of the Trinity. Yeah, it seems like that's the case. Yeah, I know Kim is not fully sold on passability. Okay. Um, uh, like she's much more leaning towards impassibility. Yeah. Um, so I know that about, we didn't talk about that in the episodes, though, but we had a lot of personal conversations about yeah. that. So yeah. I'm curious to see how this goes, but it does seem like whatever yeah. the indwelling is going to be, it does seem like there's going to be some kind of some kind of personal relationship going on there. Yeah. And then and and the, spirit. the other thing that I was thinking is like for this this conversation, you could tell me if anyone was having this conversation on indwelling and the different um, forms of grace. So like whenever you're having these conversations on soteriology, you constantly hear about like the dwelling or the dwelling of the spirit, the drawing of the spirit, the enlightening. Like if you're a Methodist, you create like any kind of, you know, <laughs> type yeah, of grace yeah. and it's the Holy Spirit doing it. And so like, yeah. I, I mean, what that actually looks like though is never clearly defined. You know, like if the spirit's like actually active in you, you know, uh, I guess like influencing you to to have certain desires or um, persuasively, how is that happening? You know, and so I think that conversation of like theological anthropology, <laughs> and pneumatology and mm. And then just kind of soteriology, like, man, I would love to see more of that done. Because that would kind of bring clarity to some preaching, you know, that I like. I, I would, yeah, I think it needs to be done because I think it's an area of Christian thought that it's, we talk like it's really important, but there's not a lot of good work done on it yet. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to get some listener questions. Thank you yeah, so much for uh, bearing with me on all mm-hmm. of these little Oh, yeah, no, that's cool. Uh, so, yeah, um, Matthew Graham says, maybe I should ask differently. Oh, okay, so his first question is, does it follow that God cannot comprehend? human affective states because he himself has cannot have those affective states. And then he says, should I ask differently, why can God, why can God not comprehend human affective states? Right. No, you know, I know. I, um, I understand the question. Yeah. So the, so the claim would be if you cannot possibly have certain phenomenal states, uh, mm-hmm. so states which phenomenal states are like what it's like, mm-hmm. if you can't possibly have those, then of course you couldn't understand them. Um, because uh, phenomenal states are different than propositional knowledge. So th- the story that I give in the, in the book is a story about a scientist named Mary, who she's trapped in this like black and white lab, and she's yeah. never seen the color red, but she knows all the propositional knowledge there is to, to know about like color theory and redness. And then um, somehow she's able to break out of the lab, and she finally sees like a red rose for the first time, and she sees the color red. And so most philosophers want to say that experience of seeing the color red, there's something that's like to see red. And it's a new kind of knowledge that she didn't have before uh, because her propositional knowledge didn't give her that. And so a lot of philosophers will say, yeah, there's a difference between this propositional knowledge and this phenomenal knowledge. Um, If you're the sort of thing that cannot have certain kinds of phenomenal knowledge, then of course you're not going to be able to understand the phenomenal knowledge. You can't understand what it's like if you just can't possibly even have that kind of knowledge. Um, And so I think that's right. So can God know what it's like to be sad? Well, not if he's in a state of undisturbable bliss. If it's undisturbable, it's, it's, it means it's not possibly able to be disturbed. But being sad just entails being uh, disturbed uh, from your bliss. Okay. Gotcha. So, yeah, so it really does rule it out. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, another question, what does Aquinas mean in SCG question 90 uh, when he says that joy and delight are proper to the divine nature? So joy and delight, yeah. So this is the perfect happiness we're talking about here. Um, so his joy, his delight, his bliss, his felicity, you know, there's lots of different ways that classical theists talk about it. It's based on himself. So again, that, um, that perfect happiness argument that I ran earlier, the idea is if you want to be perfectly happy, you need to be acquainted with a perfect good. And Aquinas says God is the, like the, the greatest good and God's perfectly acquainted with himself because, you know, so he's going to be happy. So that's what yeah. God, uh, God's joy and happiness is delight is grounded in. Mm-hmm. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, 
So this one says, do you think Robert's view, um, Robert, Roberts, I guess, was the guy that we were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think his view is compatible with a Thomistic view of the passions as motions of the sensitive appetite or sensitive appetite clarification? Motions of the sensitive appetite are not in God since they are passive potencies. However, joy and delight are in God, but not as passive potencies. Mm. Okay, so, okay, because I was thinking that the question was going to go in a different way. So I'll, I'll make two statements. So one, um, Robert's account of emotions in general would be, you know, somewhat broadly kind of consistent with a sort of Thomistic account of emotions. Um, but it's going to be inconsistent with, uh, Roberts thinks that if this is really what emotions are like, if they really are these concern-based construals, then that's just inconsistent with a uh, impassable God. So Roberts has like various arguments. He wants to run for God having to be passable because he thinks if, if you're really perfectly rational, then you're going to have certain kinds of emotional states. And if you're perfectly good, um, and perfectly rational, you're going to be attuned to the world in a particular way. And well, if God's perfectly rational, perfectly, uh, uh, perfectly morally good, he's going to be attuned to reality in a particular way mm-hmm. and, and have a concern based construal towards it. Yeah. which entails that he's going to have certain emotions that are influenced by things outside of himself. So Roberts thinks that his account of emotions just entails that it's, God's going to have to be passable. Good, good, good. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to do an, a fake outro for the uh, the, cool. uh, the YouTube, but then we'll still be on for a couple minutes. Um, guys, I want to let you know that tomorrow I'll be speaking with Dr. J.C. Beal about his book, um, The Contradictory Christ. And also, uh, per, per his request, we'll be giving away a free copy of that book. So uh, when that copy comes in, I have my own, but when that copy comes in, uh, we'll be sending it out to one of the next 10 subscribers. So we have 421 subscribers. When we get to 431, we'll pick randomly uh, from that hat and you'll be getting a free copy of a very expensive book, which is very gracious uh, on Dr. Beale's part to have done that. So uh, yeah, if you guys are watching, you haven't subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And also if you're already subscribed, don't forget to share this content uh, with anyone that you think it will be helpful uh, with. So uh, Thank you, Dr. Mullins, for coming on. And uh, thank you guys for watching. Y'all have a blessed day and I'll see you tomorrow. All right. Yeah. So I just wanted to keep you on because I'm like, man, that already has 65 views.